Uh, good evening, and um, um, thank you for joining uh, me here with the, the Cumbria Wildlife Trust. I am uh, deeply, deeply disappointed um, that uh, this, this remains remote because this has been a perfect opportunity to come and get early tastes of, of Cumbria uh, autumn. Um, but uh, as it is, I shall have to uh, uh, remain remote for, for a while. Um, please do, as we go along, if you have any questions, um, you can stick them into the, the, the questioning bit. Um, there will also be a couple of links, three links, hopefully, popping up along the way, thanks to Helen at um, uh, the Wildlife Trust, who is, is keeping me in order. And, um, and if anything else goes wrong, Helen will step in and, and probably shout at me. Um, so I'm now going to, to share materials. I'm going to put on um, uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to talk. And at, at, at the moment, I'm in this strange situation whereby um, it's, it's, oh, oh, wait a minute. So somebody's actually said hello. This is great. That means you can see me and hear me because at the moment I am speaking to you, presuming that you can, uh, uh, which, which takes a degree of confidence in myself. Um, so uh, um, thank you very much for uh, uh, noticing that, um, oh, recognizing. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Good. Right. Let's see what happens when I press this button. And um, that doesn't help. No presentation materials. No, that's not what you need. Um, share screen. And then I shall go to here and I shall press play. Now, I am really seriously hoping that you are seeing a slide which says, why did the hedgehog cross the road? Um, Helen, if there is a problem, you have my phone number. Uh, could you phone me and tell me that that's not what people are seeing? Um, it's <coughs> I do a large number of talks and, and sometimes you'll end up uh, doing a talk which is uh, um, uh, for the Wims Institute, but actually you're using the, the slideshow that you, you, you actually developed for your stand-up routine you were doing with Robin Ince, and sometimes uh, those things are not necessarily um, agreeable to each other. Uh, so assuming we've got to the right place at the right time, why did the hedgehog cross the road? It sounds like the beginning of a really bad joke, um, and there are many, many alternative answers to this, to, to, to show he had guts, to, to see her flatmate, all of those sorts of things. And, and it, but it's nothing to do with that. Why did the hedgehog cross the road? Well, as you'll see through this uh, uh, presentation, the reason the hedgehog crossed the road is because our planning system is so utterly inept and so designed to not help wildlife in general and hedgehogs in particular, that the hedgehog had no choice but to cross the road. This is actually, in effect, going to be a, a, a talk looking at the issue of habitat fragmentation, the way we've split our landscape up into smaller and smaller pieces. And the hedgehog is one of the most effective species at sort of telling that story and hopefully alerting people to the need to make a change. So a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been doing the same thing for a very long time, it feels like. Um, this photograph, my uh, supervisor at the time, I was radio tracking hedgehogs in Devon, um, sent it to me quite recently. And um, I, I was great to see what I was uh, doing back in, this was uh, 1992, I think, or 93, radio tracking hedgehogs in Devon. Um, I actually started working on hedgehogs in 1986, or was it 1987, 1986? Uh, when I went up to Orkney, uh, looking at the impact of hedgehogs on ground nesting birds. Um, most people, when they start doing an ecological survey, they'll start on one species and then sort of gradually move on, often up what you might describe as a sort of charismatic megafauna tree until they end up sort of peaking with elephants and, 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 and lions. I started with hedgehogs and apart from a, a brief year spent studying pangolins, um, I've stuck uh, uh, largely with hedgehogs. Maybe anyway, the amusement of this photograph was that my wife had just taken a photograph of me, so I say it was about three years ago, and basically nothing's changed. Uh, the only, only difference really is that I, I'm now encouraged to wear gloves in photographs when handling hedgehogs uh, because they carry all sorts of zoo noses. I mean, it's something which um, is, is inevitable, really. I mean, these, they, they carry salmonella, they carry uh, um, all sorts of uh, uh, bugs, and um, the, the, they carry ringworm, um, which, I, again, I was, I was sort of aware of, but wasn't really anticipating a problem. But when I was um, doing some uh, research, going and visiting a, a bunch of hedgehog rescues, uh, I, um, I met a woman who ran a hedgehog rescue, and a lot of people who run hedgehog rescues, and I'm sure there'll be some people there who are involved with hedgehog rescue. And if so, you will have to, I hope, admit that you can be quite an eccentric bunch. Anyway, this particular uh, woman 
was re- re- telling me the story of how she'd gone to the doctor with with a horrible uh, sort of growth on her nose and she was really worried she'd got skin cancer and uh, so she went to the doctors and the doctors immediately reassuring and just saying no no it's definitely not skin cancer in in, in fact it's it's very unusual um you you appear to have ringworm on your nose how on earth um, could you get ringworm, which is a contact-based infection? How could you get ringworm on your nose? Have you come into close contact with any animals? And it was at that point she had to admit uh, um, that she used to kiss a lot of her hedgehogs goodnight. Um, so anyway, if you take nothing home from this lecture, uh, at least maybe uh, um, take the message of not kissing hedgehogs. Anyway, so I, I've done a lot of, of the same sort of things. I, I, in between, I've gone off out to the Outer Hebrides campaigning um, uh, to stop hedgehogs being killed. Um, and that uh, uh, led me, they, they were being killed by the RSPB and um, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, as they were at the time, uh, to try and control their impact on ground nesting birds in the Outer Hebrides. And so, so through all of this, I sort of developed a bit of a hedgehoggy profile and uh, um, ended up uh, writing books. Um, um, accidentally, wasn't planning on writing books. Um, and I've written books about other things too, uh, but um, three of them so far about hedgehogs. Uh, when, when I told my wife I was writing a second book about hedgehogs, she became a little bit miffed. Uh, then there was a third book about hedgehogs. I haven't actually told her yet that I've got a fourth book about hedgehogs I want to write as well. Uh, the first book about, uh, well, the first book I wrote, uh, A Pretty Affair, um, is, is, is it all about the natural history of hedgehogs. Oh, I should say, you see, if I was doing this in person, not only would I have the, the benefits of, of uh, your wonderful in-person hospitality, I'd have the benefits of your gorgeous landscape, but I also have the benefits of standing in front of a room full of you with stacks of books, hoping at the end you'll be so moved as to um, step forward and, and buy them. So, so this is by means of a really subtle advert. Um, you know, Christmas isn't far away. Uh, and uh, um, um, books would make a wonderful present. Anyway, so the first book, A Pretty Affair, remains the only book in print, in fact, um, to have endorsements on the cover from both uh, Jeanette Winterson, um, the, one of the greatest uh, living writers in the country, and Anne Whittacombe. Um, and uh, this is, I think it's been shown to be the only thing these two people agree on, it is the wonderfulness of hedgehogs. Uh, the second book I wrote was about the iconography of the hedgehog. And then more recently, uh, last year, in fact, um, The Hedgehog Book is a, a sweet little book from Graph Egg. And, um, and whilst we're on the subject of sweet little books from Graph Egg, uh, this is a really shameless plug because um, a week on Thursday, ta-da, my new book comes out. Um, I'm, I've written a book about beavers because it's important to realise there is more to me than just hedgehogs. Uh, and um, um, the, the Beaver book is just a, a fan, it's fantastic fun for me because I've had a whole uh, chunk of time delving deep into the world of this amazing ecosystem engineer. And, and I finished writing the book in May. And then just there's been nonstop stories of, of different areas, different wildlife trusts um, taking beavers under their, under their wing. I, I don't know what's going on with Cumbria. I know that Derbyshire um, released beavers last weekend, I think it was. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see that this, this once hammered beast um, it is now being, being uh, reintegrated back into our ecosystem. It will be interesting, to see, as I say, if somebody drops a note, I'll see it at the end, uh, whether Cumbria has beavers planned for launch in the near future. Um, I am also the spokesperson for the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. I, basically what it means is when there is a hedgehoggy story going on, I get lots of phone calls from, from the press. Um, and and it, it means that, that my natural uh, uh, fondness for talking about hedgehogs mixed in with, with my tendency to be a show off get, gets perfect, perfect attention. Um, uh, but it's, it's also the Hedgehog Society. We help fund a lot of the research which goes on because what we really want to do is make sure that the, the uh, conservation messages that we put out are uh, based on robust science. There's no point you know, making stuff up because we need this to be properly robust science. Um, and I have over the over the years, people have often asked me why I keep going on and on about hedgehogs. And um, actually, there is a very simple reason. And this 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 slide is based around it. Every time there's a vote or a poll, the hedgehog wins for the nation's nature icon, favorite wild animal, favorite mammal. The hedgehog wins. And this may seem like the most trivial of reasons to be spending time 
talking about hedgehogs. But as, as a wildlife trust, I'm sure you are trying to raise the awareness about a whole range of complex issues which affect the overall wildlife that is sort of under your, your, your auspices. And you know, these will be things to do with, with the transport infrastructure, with agricultural policy, with planning and development, with climate change. All of these different things can be quite prickly issues. Um, but and, and, and you can use, they will divide opinion, many of them. But if you start the conversations with talking about hedgehogs, people will be listening because they're not going to be immediately uh, uh, having their backs up because something in there is bothering them. You start talking about badgers or you start talking about foxes, you're bound to get a reaction. Um, and this is something which the hedgehog really overcomes. Just So there is a really good reason for this. My my passion, my love is for nature. I, I love the natural world. I find the hedgehog a fantastically useful tool to help share the story about the, the, the wonders of the natural world, but also in terms of encouraging and directing people into making choices, making differences in their lives, which can actually help wildlife. And, and by helping hedgehogs in most instances, um, you do things to help hedgehogs, you're helping a whole range of other species too. And we need to do that. Now, this, I have to say, is a, a slightly disappointing slide. Um, the State of Britain's Hedgehogs Report 2018 uh, is being superseded by the State of Britain's Hedgehogs Report 2021. Uh, but that isn't finished yet. And um, I think probably wisely, the people putting it together have not given me the latest data because they know I'll blab about it. So I'm having to give you old data. Hopefully within the next month and a bit, uh, we'll be able to release the State of Britain's Hedgehogs 2021. And hopefully that'll get a lot of press coverage and you'll find out, I'll find out uh, what's going on. So up until 2018, we've been running a sequence of surveys, uh, a lot of them citizen science based. We've also been working with the British Trust for Ornithology using their surveys as well. And these give us an indicator of change over time. We don't know how many hedgehogs there are. The, the figure which is often quoted in the press of there being over 30 million hedgehogs in the 1950s is a fairly unrobust extrapolation um, of an evening's walk around Kew Gardens one summer. So you know, this, is, this is, is not something which is robust. What is robust is that between the year 2000 and 2018, urban hedgehog population was down 30% and rural hedgehog population was down 50%. Now, they sound quite dramatically bad, uh, but there is some good news in that, in that since the 2015 survey, the urban population had decline had leveled off. However, rural population decline was still in freefall. Now, this is, is significant. It's important. Um, the, more recently, we've got uh, the Mammal Society uh, made an assessment. Um, they reckoned it was about a 65, 66% decline since the uh, mid-1990s. Uh, we've had the hedgehog added to the red list now as a species considered vulnerable to extinction. Interestingly, the only reason it hadn't been added to that list up until then was because of the paucity of the data. It wasn't down to the fact that, that there was... We didn't think there was a problem. We, we instinctively knew there was. Um, so what does this mean overall? Well, I have done over the years hundreds of talks um, to women's institute groups, to towns, women guild groups, to the University of the Third Age, to gardening clubs, to basically anywhere which would give me a bit of money and cake. And, um, and they have given me access to an audience. I was realizing this. Um, the audience, when I first started doing it to hedgehog talks, the audience were all quite old compared to me. But, but I'm sort of gradually catching my audience up, which is rather alarming. But what it gave me was an insight into uh, anecdotes of you know, days gone by. How many hedgehogs did you see when you were a kid? I can ask a bunch of people far older than me. And this led me to the guess. And that is all it is. It's a guess uh, that we have had a population decline of between 90 and 95 percent since the end of the Second World War. Now, that is... Yes, that's based on not a lot of robust science, but I think it's fairly reasonable. Um, however, that's not a figure that I sort of use when I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the press because people will leap into hyperbole. And um, uh, when we had published a 2015 report, 
The wonderful Michaela Strachan wrote an article in which she said that the hedgehogs would be extinct in 10 years time. She had drawn a graph, basically, which plotted the points on it that uh, uh, we had collected with our, our, our data and then drawn a straight line through them. Then it hit zero in, in, in 10 years time. That's not the way ecology works. And I did presume that she had been misquoted. It is very, very likely. I've been on the receiving end of this myself. Um, the journalists will will half read a story. They'll get the best bit of the story and they'll run with it without realizing maybe she was talking about localized extinctions or whatever. I had uh, in my role as the, the spokesperson for the Hedgehog Society, a lot of phone calls, as you can imagine, in that time. And um, it got to the point where I had told so many journalists that they really ought to be making sure that they're quoting people precisely, especially over issues like this, because it's important not to over egg this pudding because that 10 years time is actually now four years time. And clearly hedgehogs won't be extinct in four years time. Um, and, and so anybody who was then moved to act by that panic stricken plea um, is going to sort of see that, well, maybe we don't need to act. We don't need to leap into hyperbole. Anyway. Um, what was delightful was that the Independent, um, still in existence at the time, one of the last journalists to contact me, um, and they proved without a shadow of a doubt that they are willing to quote absolutely uh, precisely. Um, I do also uh, run courses on how to deal with the media. And the first one is never just say what's at the top of your mind. Um, do think first before you speak when uh, being interviewed by a journalist. Um, so, yes, I find it interesting that the hedgehog that the Independent used to use for nearly all its stories was this particular picture. And, and there are three clear indicators uh, um, here that this is a hedgehog in trouble. It, it's out in daytime on the whole. Hedgehogs out in daytime are ill. It's got ticks all over its face and and it just looks poorly. Um, this is a, a, a typical ill hedgehog and I'm really hoping that the photographer uh, took the photograph and then took the hedgehog to a rescue centre. So anyway, we don't need hyperbole. The situation is bad enough as it is. Um, but the question is, how have we got to this position? How has the population declined by, in rural areas, 50% since the turn of the century um, and continues to be in freefall? Well, part of it, most of it, is fairly predictable. Um, Dave Goulson's uh, fairly recent report looking at um, the, the uh, numbers of applications of biocides to industrial agricultural crops showed that on, on average there are 17 different biocides applied to a crop. So that, that's not 17 different outings with tractors, but um, you know, there are tank mixes, but this means you know, molluscicides and herbicides and fungicides and, and in, insecticides and, and, and all sorts of things out there. I mean, you can't grow a crop of oilseed rape like this without an awful lot of, of um, uh, molluscicide. And uh, what this does, and, and, and this is, this, this should say, this isn't a farmer bashing thing. This is a, a reality thing. If you are trying to, to, to make a profit, um, you need to deal with the competition. The unfortunate thing is that in this instance, um, the competition happens to be hedgehog food and toad food and bat food and, and farmland bird food. And so what we've done is create an ecological desert over much of the, the countryside. Um, and you add into that that you, you think of the name hedgehog um, and, and it, then you ask yourself, what is the favourite habitat of, of the hedgehog? And obviously it is the hedgerow. It's the woodland edge. They're a woodland edge specialist. And we have done amazing things for hedgehogs in our landscape, um, admittedly uh, at the expense of, uh, at the, expense of the um, once thriving uh, um, uh, community based uh, uh, rural uh, uh, population um, who in the 18th century in particular were, were totally disenfranchised by the Enclosures Acts. Um, but what happened is, is that the, the land was enclosed by rich people coming back with money they'd made uh, out of slavery and um, they in, had to enclose them using hedgerows and where there weren't hedging opportunities, they used dry stone walls. And this chopped the landscape up into lots of little pieces which they could own, kicked poor people off the land into the poor houses and the Industrial Revolution and created an amazingly increased amount of hedgerows for hedgehogs to be able to move through the landscape. So, yeah, it mixed things. However, the removal of those hedgerows then further sort of fragments the landscape, chops it up into little pieces. You have an enormous field of oilseed rape 
And um, there's no incentive for a hedgehog to walk into that because there's no food there and there's no shelter. And they can walk around the edges of it until they find themselves a hedgerow. But these hedgerows and these fence lines and these walls are further and further and further apart, meaning that the, the, the ability to move through the landscape is curtailed. Um, this is where I will sometimes uh, um, lose friends. Um, I gave a, I was doing a, a, a talk at the Beaver Trust, uh, Beaver, I've got beavers on the brain, sorry, Badger Trust, um, at the Badger Trust AGM uh, a few years ago. And Dominic Dyer was the boss at the uh, Badger Trust at the time. And, and it's sort of in a stage whisper as he walked me up onto the uh, onto the stage. He uh, he sort of said to me, um, I, I've left the fire exit ajar so that you can get out all the quicker because he knew that I was about to upset a bunch of badger lovers. Um, you will find maybe not with a wildlife trust because you may be a little more ecologically articulate. However, um, you will find often that there are two groups of people when it comes to the badger um, and that there are those who believe that the badger can do no wrong, that in the pantheon that all that is good, uh, you know, the badger is up there with, with Lady Di and, and, and uh, Mother Teresa. Um, and then there are those who know with equal vigour uh, that the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse had a pet badger um, and that badgers are responsible for everything from Brexit to Covid to Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. Um, all of these things caused by this one evil creature. Now, uh, what I then have to do is apologise for what I'm about to say. Um, this is not a black and white issue. Um, it, it, it's complicated. It's ecology. Uh, if, 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 it was, if it was simple and straightforward, we could hand over the study of our ecosystems to, I don't know, astrophysicists. But if you really, really want complicated science, uh, do ecology. When the revelation is made, as it is every now and then, that badgers kill hedgehogs, and I know badgers kill hedgehogs because badgers definitely eat hedgehogs. I uh, pushed my way into the undergrowth when I was radio tracking hedgehogs in Devon um, and, and stopped in horror as I found a badger eating my little willy. Now, uh, what that also did was really instruct me on, on naming my hedgehogs um, in perhaps a more serious manner. Um, badgers will eat hedgehogs. Um, we know that that increased presence of badgers causes a decreased presence of hedgehogs in many and most instances. Whenever these sorts of uh, bits of information come to light, we get some of the, the farming press that those true countrymen who truly know uh, uh, what is right, unlike us soft, uh, um, um, delicate fingered uh, um, townies, uh, people like Robin Page, um, and they will come out uh, um, with yet another good excuse uh, um, to, to kill badgers. Isn't it a great shame? We've got to kill badgers because we can use that as an, a way to save hedgehogs. Um, and it's really not it's really not that simple. Um, um, the, this is, I should point out, Robin Page even got sacked by the Telegraph. Um, so so it, it's, this is this sort of attitude, this sort of knee jerk reaction, which is particularly popular amongst um, uh, Tory uh, um, agriculture ministers of some sort or other, is not based on good science. The point is, these two species have what's known as an asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. And um, this, what this basically means, and so I should say, our best understanding of the relationship between uh, the badger and the hedgehog is that it is an asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship, because uh, the point of research, the point of science is that we're just trying to find the best way of explaining uh, what we see around us. What this essentially means is that you've got two species which are principally competitors for the same food resource. Both species principally eat macroinvertebrates. They, they, worms are a, a thing constant in both their diets throughout the year. Um, badgers are better at eating worms than hedgehogs. They, they can dig, whereas hedgehogs can just scratch the surface um, of the soil. Uh, badgers, so badgers will outcompete hedgehogs for some of the food. Uh, badgers are also more omnivorous, so they have an advantage there as well. But our understanding is that when the wider ecosystem becomes degraded. Uh, the badger switches from um, um, having a relationship with hedgehogs based on competition uh, to one which becomes predatory. And um, and say, if we learn more, then I'm happy to change my view. But that's our best understanding of it as it is. Um, 
should add into the mix that not only will badgers eat hedgehogs and they compete for the same food resource, but badgers also fragment the landscape. You're going to see a theme coming here. Um, presence of badger sets or badger latrines down a hedgerow, fence line or a wall um, will cause a, a hedgehog dispersing from what they refer to in the literature as a, a rural refugia, um, otherwise known as a village. Um, it will cause the hedgehogs to get as far as that, turn around and come back again. The presence of badgers forces the hedgehogs closer to human dwellings um, and, and prevents them moving through the landscape. Um, just in case you want to follow this up, I do recommend, if, you, if you're sort of questioning and wanting a more detail, this paper from Ben Williams is part of the work that um, we've been funding um, on, on uh, the, the, um, the interrelationships between hedgehogs and badgers, uh, a particularly uh, interesting and good piece of work. Um, so, uh, inevitably, um, um, our transport infrastructure plays a part to, in the demise of the hedgehog too. Again, there are people who will quote figures of 350,000 hedgehogs being killed a year um, on, on the roads. Um, and that is, unfortunately, based on a misreading of a scientific paper, uh, which was looking back into the, the, well, using data from the 1960s onwards. Um, and uh, the, the, it's probably somewhere just less than 100,000 hedgehogs being killed on the roads each year at the moment. Still an awful lot. Um, and, and it's an inevitable consequence of, of, of uh, a nocturnal creature trying to move uh, uh, through the landscape and finding itself uh, uh, sort of hit by these, these barriers of, of moving cars. But also, and again, this relates to, uh, similar to the badger. Yes, the badger kills hedgehogs, but the badgers also fragment the landscape. Cars, vehicles kill hedgehogs, but busy roads fragment the landscape. And this is the ring road around Oxford. There was a really horrible car crash there. Uh, 15 or so years ago. So they put in concrete barriers around much of the ring road. And what this does is turn a, a difficult to cross uh, barrier um, into an impossible to cross barrier. In fact, what you can see across the road is a nature reserve and where I'm standing is suburban East Oxford. This uh, has now created a complete obstacle to travel. Um, so we fragment the landscape even further. And this fragmentation uh, um, can come in many different scales. Uh, this is the brook 50 metres behind me, um, uh, Boundary Brook uh, in East Oxford. And this is one of four hedgehogs I've rescued there over the last 20 years. Um, it was canalised in the, um, I think it was the late 70s, in a, an attempt to, to stop flooding uh, down our street. Um, and and it, probably, it probably works as a system um, if you don't have Thames water uh, being inept. Um, so we still occasionally have uh, to wade through <clears throat> unpleasant trees in our gardens. Anyway, that to one side. What it also is, is a pitfall trap. And there is simply no way a hedgehog can get out of that once it's fallen in um, and, and they will die. Uh, these barriers occur all over the place. The, the little path at the top of the picture, the bridge across the brook, is um, a very, a very doggy path. In fact, it leads into what is known as poo path um, <coughs> for obvious reasons <coughs> and, um, and will therefore not necessarily be very popular to hedgehogs. I should also say now uh, we've got resident badgers in our area, which will account for the... Um, me not seeing any hedgehogs around my garden for quite some time. So the fragmentation. Um, the reason why it becomes increasingly important to talk about fragmentation is because of the distances that hedgehogs will move. This is an 18 hole golf course in Surrey. And a friend of mine, uh, Nigel Reeve, did this research. Um, in the space of 12 nights, um, a male hedgehog covered the entire thing, played an entire round. That's about 30 hectares. When you start to look at the home ranges of hedgehogs, as he did, he found that male hedgehogs have a home range of about 30 hectares. They don't have territories they defend, just home ranges that they somewhat grumpily share. Females about 10 hectares. A male hedgehog moves on average two kilometres a night, female hedgehog one kilometre a night. You're beginning to get a picture of how far they can travel, how much land they need. They need the variety of places for food, for shelter, for water and for finding mates. But what does that mean for a requirement for the population? I mean, the, the minimum viable population analysis, which was done by uh, another friend of mine, Tom Morehouse, uh, is really revealing and, and quite terrifying. 
Um, so you, the minimum viable population, if you imagine an island um, uh, out in the middle of the ocean uh, and it's the most perfect hedgehog habitat you can imagine and it's really big and it's got one male hedgehog on it, then obviously that's not a viable population. And if you've got a small desert island um, with a, a thousand hedgehogs on it, that's not a viable population because you know, they won't be able to survive. Um, you collect all the data you can about the requirements for hedgehogs, stick it into a computer model. And what Tom uh, showed was that in good habitat, which actually, Surrey Golf Course, surrounded by gardens, putting out supplementary food is quite a good habitat. What you'll find is uh, the minimum viable population, starting populations, 32 individuals in 90 hectares. When you start moving out into our rural landscape with the issues of, of lack of food, with badges, with other things you need, you know, over 100 hedgehogs to start it and, and many square kilometres. But still, in our urban landscape, you need nearly a square kilometre of unfragmented landscape to have a viable population of hedgehogs. And that's where you start to see the problem. Where do we have a, a square kilometre without a, a canal running through it, a busy road running through it, a line of fences for new housing development? All of these things having that sort of impact. Now, this is possibly my favorite little graphic um, of all time, because uh, when I was radio tracking hedgehogs, you were out all night and frequently the pouring rain, um, um, getting cold and, and, and struggling to keep up with your hedgehogs. Uh, now, uh, researchers at um, this was actually University, uh, Nottingham Trent University students working in Brighton stick GPS tags on the hedgehogs. Now, have a look at the way they move. These are the red one in particular, male hedgehogs. So the red, the green, the pink and the yellow are male. They move much further, um, um, obviously speeded up daytime. Now the hedgehogs are static. Um, I find it interesting. Eight o'clock, they start moving again. And um, you can see in this housing estate how many gardens a lot of these hedgehogs are actually going through and going between. How many times they're crossing these small roads in a housing estate. And I think it's uh, um, deeply uh, um, educational and, and somewhat worrying about how much space they need. And um, also, it makes me realise that um, I should have been born a little bit later uh, because it would have saved me hours and hours and hours of really cold and lonely work. So you can see the sorts of distances I'll travel. So this obviously this led to uh, um, all of this information uh, fed into the launch of our campaign Hedgehog Street. Uh, the collaboration between the Hedgehog Society and the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And uh, this is our 10th anniversary. Uh, rather pleased with that. And in fact, just today, um, I have been involved with the judging of the, the, the Hedgehog Street Bake Off. Uh, we've been having a, a cake competition. Um, unfortunately, it's all being done remotely. So I've just been having to judge cakes um, on their aesthetic appeal. Um, I'm getting good at this. Uh, and uh, but yeah, we're having some fun with this. We just got over 100,000 um, champions, hedgehog champions signing up to the Hedgehog Street campaign. Uh, it's all free, obviously, just just sign up and 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 share your data. Uh, I don't need your personal data. I mean, your sightings of hedgehogs, all that sort of thing. This is really important. We've got the big hedgehog map, for example. And the main part of it, the simplest part of it is to connect your gardens. Now, I find this particular approach of campaign really interesting because we've got some enormous issues about the transport infrastructure, about the way we grow our food, about the you know, climate change, about everything else going on out there, about badges. We can't affect that so easily ourselves. Um, however, we have a patch, many of us are lucky enough to have a patch of land which we can have an impact on. We can turn our gardens into wildlife friendly places and we can make sure they're connected. Um, do not um, um, employ me um, to make holes. I borrowed a, a very terrifying drill and drill bit and I found the entire process uh, um, really, really, I should say terrifying. I'm not designed to use power tools, I reckon. Uh, it took an hour to get through a double skin wall like that, but we know it works because we have a stunt hedgehog with us and um, we get it. That was a 127 millimeter drill bit. We're aiming for a 13 centimeter square hole, but that's the easiest thing in terms of drilling. And um, this has been the part of our campaign is getting people to make holes in fences. Obviously, um, you can get an angry hedgehog and a big catapult and fire it at the base of a fence. Um, but uh, there are many approaches that you can take. And, and my favorite village um, 
is called Kirtlington, just north of Oxford, uh, foothills of the Cotswolds. And I've been to the Kirtlington Wildlife and Conservation Society to talk on a number of occasions. And I think they were beginning to get fed up with me just turning up and, and going on at them about what they need to do. And so they, they um, um, Chris Powell's, uh, who's there, sort of chief organizer, um, organized a group, they got together, they got a big map of the village and uh, they looked at the minimum number of holes they would need to make in the walls to connect the maximum number of gardens. And they've pretty much connected up the entire village now using a whole array of different styles to do this, working with the churchyard, working with everybody they can imagine. Um, but Chris's garden is two and a half feet lower than his neighbours. And I'd asked him what he was going to do about that. And he said, sort of with a smile, he said, oh, I'm going to build a staircase. So I actually thought he was joking. Um, but no, he's, he built a staircase. And uh, um, this is one of those moments when you realise that, that if you build it, they will come. Admittedly, he had been baiting you know, either end of it, as it were. But on the first night, it was opened up for use. A hedgehog came out of the hole at the top and stood on the dais at the top and then sashayed down the staircase. And it was a real indication that, that if you put the work in, these things can really, really make a difference. Um, he sent me a video from a year or so later um, just showing you that the hedgehogs can use the staircase going forwards and backwards. And if you pay attention, you might notice uh, a design flaw. So I have asked Chris to install a banister uh, just to avoid um, the, the, the loss of dignity, which comes for something like that. The hedgehog won't be hurt. Hedgehog spines are, are particularly effective shock absorbers because um, if they were direct straight sort of needles sticking out of their skin, uh, um, any fall would have them impaled back into the body. So they, they, they flex. And um, um, so they, they're very effective at, uh, at climbing if they need to. So. That was good. That was impressive. Now, I went to photograph Chris earlier this year for a magazine. Uh, I was doing a piece of the BBC Wildlife magazine and um, wanted a, a, a fresh photograph of him. And whilst I'd, after I'd done that, he said, oh, you've got to see what I did next. And he took me to one of his other neighbours' gardens, which is an even bigger height differential. And I just I just love that. Um, this is I mean, he's covered it. I think it's, it's sort of, he ran concrete or cement down it so that it's rough as a surface and uh, he's about six foot tall i should point out you know that is no mean uh, a bit of development but does it work well again trail cameras are a great thing um build it and um and they will come so this is a real indicator that if you've got the hedgehogs present and you want to increase their capacity to move through the landscape making the holes will make a difference. And obviously this is something we have been pushing time and time again. Uh, we've got fencing manufacturers now actually stepping up and doing it. And then, <clears throat> then I had an opportunity, and this is a moment when I'm hoping that some of you might um, um, be so, so kind as to, to uh, take a little bit of clicktivism. Um, Change.org got in touch with me, and you know it's three years ago now that they got in touch with me. And they said, um, hedgehogs are obviously really cute and wonderful. We want you to launch a campaign that will get hedgehogs back to their former glory. And I mean, that's what they're after, the he returning hedgehogs to their former glory. And I just said, this is it. I have been waiting 30 years for this opportunity. I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. Let's do it. And so they said, well, what's the thing you're going to ask for? And um, so I, I said, well, it's simple. We need to, to call to dismantle industrial capitalism and replace it with something nicer. And uh, um, they said, they said no. Um, so anyway, we, we negotiated on back and forward. And in the end, in the end, I was almost embarrassed with what we came to, 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 to launch. And that was a call to have the planning laws changed so that all new housing developments had to come with hedgehog highways. But they sold it to me as, you know, this is a stepping stone to a bigger thing. You can use this as a springboard to talk about, um, you know, all the issues helping uh, that we need to do to help hedgehogs. Uh, that that you know, developers, if they end up signing up to this, great. But if they destroy all the hedgehogs before they build a housing estate, then it's just nonsense and greenwash. So it was very much sold to me as an opportunity to take it further. And then they said, and also when you do an update for the petition, um, at change.org slash save our hedgehogs. When you do an update, it goes to everybody who signs. So 
when I got to 100,000 people signing the petition, I was thinking, you know what? Nobody's ever read uh, any of my articles uh, um, with quite, you know, I have not had quite such an audience. When I got to half a million signatures with this, um, I had, uh, um, I ended up with a meeting with the then housing minister who was really disappointing and I've forgotten his name. Um, but anyway, it was a, a passing moment. I met one of the bosses of the biggest um, housing developer companies uh, in, in the country. And then there was a moment in July 2019, if you can cast your mind back to then, when you probably thought things couldn't get any worse. And then the Priapic Marshmallow moved into number 10. And at that moment, a lot of ministers were being um, sidelined, shifted and whatever. And James Brokenshire was the Secretary of State at the time. And he, on his last day in the office, he uh, published an alteration to the National Planning Policy Framework, a really dry document, but a really important document that goes out to all the local authorities and uh, giving direction as to how the planning system should work. And in it was included for the first time a call to have hedgehog highways in place. Unfortunately, it was under just guidance and there were absolutely no teeth to enforce it. Fortunately, lots of local authorities, are the planning departments, are beginning to listen to their ecologists who are saying we should make this happen. It's been an amazing adventure going along with this. I've now got to over a million signatures. Um, I, I had basically all of lockdown. Well, actually, so from July 2019, um, the government went into doing Brexit. Then it's gone into doing COVID. There's been um, two years of, of this sort of what might be considered less significant stuff, though I would consider equally significant stuff, um, being sidelined and ignored. Uh, now, the new housing minister is none other than Michael Gove. And, and having seen um, having seen him dancing on a couple of tabs in an Aberdeen nightclub, I'm now very confident that we can become best mates and that we shall be able to do something good. Um, I just had to put this up there. This was the an update from, from earlier this year uh, when the BBC Wildlife magazine came out. And for a brief moment, um, I impressed my daughter. I, I don't, any of you who've got daughters, my daughter's 18, I mean, she's autistic and somewhat uh, interesting. Um, and, but to impress an 18 year old autistic girl takes some doing. And this was my moment to impress her. Um, Tom Holland tweeted that I was the Lorax of hedgehogs. Unfortunately, when she discovered that uh, whilst there is a Tom Holland who is 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 uh, an amazing actor and dancer and playing Spider-Man and is apparently terribly cute. Um, this Tom Holland uh, is a historian and a Radio 4, a former Radio 4 presenter. And so she's been back to being disappointed now. Anyway, so we've got over a, a million people signed up. Please do sign up. It'd be lovely to have you. And if you want more information and you want to share the work you've done to help hedgehogs. I set up a Hedgehog Highways Facebook group because communication amongst a million people in a very simplistic sort of form setting is very difficult. I can't answer all the questions. There's now about nearly 19,000 members of this Facebook group. Um, and, and it's just a great way of, 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 if you have a problem, you can ask the question, people will answer it very quickly. Um, I'm conscious um, of, of time. Um, so I will skirt over the things which as it's a wildlife trust I'm talking to, you probably already do. Um, if you want to help wildlife, probably the simplest and best thing you can do in your garden is to put in a pond, but don't put in an ornamental pond like this, because whilst hedgehogs can swim, they can't swim forever. They need to be able to get out. Um, so if you do have an ornamental pond, put in a ramp, build a rocky beach, anything like that, so that hedgehogs can escape. Um, I won't need to talk to you about litter, but I use this picture when I'm talking to primary schools. I do have a warning sign beforehand. Um, this hedgehog is actually under anaesthetic. It's been found with a, a, a elastic band caught round its neck and under its arm. Um, I read a figure that it was something over a million elastic bands are dropped every day by the Postal Service. Uh, you can collect up elastic bands and put them back into the post box and they get returned back into the system. Um, and it's something which is a bit frustrating. Hedgehog Society has been running a campaign for a long time. And um, the uh, uh, you, you can get this as a sticker form, stick it on your letterbox, stick it on the post box. Remind uh, our postal workers uh, that you can reuse those elastic bands and that they kill wildlife. Um, you may be thinking that it would be good just as winter is hitting your garden, just to tidy things up a little bit. Please bear in mind that the hedgehogs, hedgehogs do not have a fight or flight response. So that when they hear the noise of a mower or a strimmer, um, what they're going to do is frown. Uh, they frown, the spines come forward over their eyes and their nose, and, uh, and then they roll up into a ball if they're really scared. And obviously that's no good when you've got sharp bladed things charging towards you. 
hedgehog rescues are filled with animals which have been maimed by these sorts of things. Please, please, please be careful. We actually have a hedgehog society campaign with um, uh, the managers of amenity grasslands and things, council workers, other uh, uh, um, land managers, um, just to get some stickers onto their mowing machines, uh, um, asking them to reminding them to just run the blunt end of a rake or something uh, um, along a hedgerow before you go and cut right up to it, because the hedgehogs will often be in the, the sort of early parts of that. And right now, this time of year, um, if you wanted to make the hedgehog the very, very best hibernaculum, their hedgehog hibernating home, what you do is you collect an enormous pile of dried leaves and you surround it by some small sticks. And then you get some bigger sticks and then you get some logs around that too. And obviously you've built yourself a bonfire, but the hedgehog sees quite the best home. Um, the simple thing is, uh, and there are very, very few excuses to need to do not do this, uh, but don't always light the bonfire on the day you make it. Don't let it sit there for a night so that hedgehogs and a whole bunch of other amazing wildlife will go and make its home. If you need to build it up over a few days, um, put fencing around it in the first instance um, or the worst instance, lift it up from one side. Because as soon as the crackling sound starts and the smoke starts, the hedgehog is going to roll up into a ball. And then if you're really lucky, you do all this stuff, you may end up with the wonderful deposits in your garden. Um, of hedgehog poo, uh, about the size of your little finger in length, blunt at one end, uh, um, slightly pointed at the other end on the whole, often quite shiny and granular because of the exoskeletons of the insects that they have eaten. And a very, very good way of telling if you've got hedgehogs in your garden. And then if you're really lucky, you might get a bit of this. Um, the hedgehog carousel, the mate, this won't be till next year, of course, the mating dance of the hedgehog. The female is in the middle and you can see that she is frowning. Her spines are brought forward over her eyes and her nose. Mating cannot take place whilst the female frowns. And this can go on and on. It can go on for over an hour with the male circling around and around and around. Um, it requires the female to relax for mating to take place. And um, But what it also does is it creates a, a flattened arena of vegetation, which has led to what I consider one of the best headlines of all time. Um, it's from 1991. I still have this piece of paper in the Guardian, hedgehogs cleared of corn circle dementia. Um, I, I don't know if you are I'm sure you remember and they pop up every now and then this this the great mystical crop circles that appear in fields in, in often in Wiltshire, um, um, not too far from the pubs where people sit with their planks of wood and their bits of rope and their theodolites and things. And uh, there are those who believe that these crop circles are either mystical earth energies rising or aliens coming down and leaving all sorts of messages. But at the Seriological Conference, which took place in 1991, keynote speaker, none other than the son of God himself, um, David Icke, um, they had a uh, uh, somebody suggesting that possibly it was hedgehogs, circling hedgehogs that were creating some of these uh, crop circles. Um, what I loved was the application of science uh, when somebody came in and pointed out that it would uh, actually require around 40,000 hedgehogs working in synchrony to create even the more modest crop circles. And therefore, it was much more likely uh, to be aliens. So um, a, a, in conclusion, what have hedgehogs ever done for us? Um, this is a, a question I'm often asked in not in a wildlife trust audience, I should say, um, because there is a tendency towards a simplistic anthropocentric view of conservation. How is it going to affect us if these species are gone? You know, if we don't have um, all those amazing uh, solitary bees and bumblebees, we are going to lose out when it comes to, to fruit and in the honeybees too. And you know, if we lose, if we, if we don't have the ecosystem engineer that is the beaver, it's going to be quite a dramatic you know, impact on our landscape and ability to cope with flooding events. The hedgehog, well, the hedgehog is the most important creature on the planet. Um, I, I love this cover. I, I treasure this cover. Save the hedgehog, save the world. I love this cover partly because we've got Obama and me, Desmond Tutu Speaks, two of the most important people on the planet, marginalised by my claims about the hedgehog. And there is a reason why I argued of the importance of the hedgehog. Um, when I was at radio tracking um, hedgehogs uh, in Devon, I ended up nose to nose with a hedgehog called Nigel. Um, so I said, you do need to name your hedgehogs. And um, we had a moment nose to nose. And I ended up looking into his eyes and realizing that I'm actually was being observed, being watched by a truly sentient and fascinating large mammal. Um, and this 
was a moment that sort of saw a transition in my relationship with with wildlife in general, but hedgehogs in particular, when I had to admit, actually, that this had moved from liking to loving. Now, the American writer Stephen Jay Gould um, wrote that, that we will not fight to save what we do not love which I think is a really significant and important thing. He was talking about conservation and all of the wildlife groups tend to understand that. Um, but if you look at the way that many of the big conservation groups uh, rely on the charismatic megafauna, um, if you look at the wonderful blue chip documentaries from, from David Ashenborough and his kin, it's relying on the impossible, the endangered and the uh, um, out of reach as a way of trying to create these relationships with the natural world. And it dawned on me that this um, is a bit rely like me relying on, on sort of supermodels and A-list celebrities uh, for getting a better understanding of human relationships. In the end, if we're fortunate, we're going to fall in love with the girl or the boy next door. Um, and, and, uh, um, and the hedgehog is that equivalent is the analog of that it's we've got an opportunity it's, it's not mystical it's not magical it's purely practical uh, that when you've rescued another hedgehog as i had here uh, a hedgehog from uh, from that boundary brook behind me um and and you, you put it down on the grass and you wait for it to unroll um you get a moment of getting nose to nose with a truly magnificent predator an absolutely amazing sentient mammal and there is very few other species that you get this opportunity to get so close to and i believe that sort of connection is absolutely crucial in tipping us over the edge from uh, just liking the natural world to loving it and once we've started loving it that's when the fun starts that's when that's when real change comes so thank you very much uh, for your attention i'm just going to get back to hopefully um, here we go. Stop sharing the screen. And I'm I'm back in the room. Wow, that was um, interesting. Now, I've got to think there's I've got to start looking at questions. Um, oh, difference between male and female, apart from obvious. <laughs> well, I was about to say, um, if it's got a willy, it's a boy. Um, if you've got a hedgehog um, in your hands and it unrolls, <clears throat> if it appears to have a tummy button, um, then then it's a male. Um, uh, but no, you can't tell at a distance um, um, from um, the, on the whole males. Actually, no, not even basically males tend to be a little bit bigger, um, but it, not to the point that it's statistically significant. Um, thank you, Karen, for that. Um, Hugh, any tips on telling hedgehogs apart? Hard to name them without spotting their individuality. Matthew, I, yeah, I had the advantage of having put a little radio transmitter on the back of each of my hedgehogs. So it did have a number code reference uh, to that. And um, but uh, I did begin to there were a number of hedgehogs I did know by sight, uh, partly by the um, the way that, that they behaved when I turned up. Some hedgehogs would just roll up into balls, some would run away and some like Nigel just carried on, uh, which was very pleasing. Um, Tanya, has any scientific research been done to gauge if releasing fostered hedgehogs helps to raise populations? Oh, that's a properly, properly good question. We have done work showing that you can release fostered hedgehogs and that they do survive. Um, but uh, what we, we haven't done is seen whether the release of fostered hedgehogs into an environment uh, boosts populations. One of the problems we always have to consider is that the if there is a if there is a problem in an area that hedgehog populations have declined, if we then step in and, and release more hedgehogs into that area, we could just be feeding a sinkhole. And the most extreme example of this is I'm getting frequently getting calls from people who want me to organize a campaign to rescue hedgehogs from New Zealand where they're being killed because they are impacting on the, the indigenous wildlife. And then... Um, uh, doing a uh, uh, releasing them into the wild here to bolster our populations. So, yes, we don't actually... Whilst the populations are still being uh, um, hammered, we can't really do that with any justification. Uh, but no, it's a very, very good question. Um, oh, thank you for the cattle grid reference. Um, what can be done about hedgehogs? Cattle grids. Oh, thank you, Daphne. So the British Hedgehog Preservation Society was founded by Major by Major Adrian Coles back in the 1980s. And um, it was started because he had noticed dead hedgehogs caught in cattle grids. Um, and you're absolutely right, hedgehogs do die down there. There is a British standard ramp, which uh, cattle grids are supposed to come with now, but old cattle grids don't have them in place. Um, if literally a brick at either end 
um, um, is enough to give well, a couple of bricks, maybe is enough to be able to give the hedgehogs uh, the stepping stones to be able to get out. You can see they can climb, uh, but it's a very, very good question. And please, if you do see them, um, if you do see cattle grids without any ramps or without any bricks, please do get in there and and start doing things. Um, the uh, Nina, the, the drill bit, that was 127 millimeter core drill bit. We're aiming for 13 centimeters, the size of a CD case as the, the principal main aim for what we can get. But in terms of drill bits, that was the most uh, accessible. Sue, I hosted a rescued three legged hedgehog in my enclosed veg patch. As I understand, it couldn't be released into the wild. Given the space you say hedgehogs needed, I wonder how frustrated. OK, it's. It, that's a really interesting question. And, and we end up having the conversation between welfare and conservation. Um, and I'm if you've got a three legged head, there are some hedgehog rescues now which simply euthanize three legged hedgehogs because they seem to turn. They seem to return to the hedgehog rescues quite often because they have a problem grooming on part of on, on, on whichever side is missing a, a rear leg. You, you, you can't release. Uh, f front amputees out because they can't scratch and feed themselves properly. Um, so, so I'm <clears throat> I, I tend towards the the sort of conservation focus rather than the individual welfare focus. But if you've got a hedgehog which actually doesn't appear to be frustrated, you can see whether a hedgehog's upset if it's you know doing stereotypical behaviour, going round in circles or whatever. Then yeah, maybe chance it in the wild. Uh, but if it appears to be one of those hedgehogs, uh, and they do have very individual characters, if it's one of those hedgehogs which seems to just be very contentedly going from food to water to bed, then I think you can relax uh, um, uh, with that. Um, two mag oh, two, yes. two magpies tried to scare my hedgehog away whilst it ate. The you see, the thing about the magpies is their beaks tend, you know, the hedgehogs tend to know that's fairly safe with a magpie around. However, some corvids will go for hedgehogs um, if they are young and poorly. Uh, will you cover how we can encourage hedgehogs into our garden? I Hopefully we've done that. Build it and they will come. There was a hedgehog in my garden on Friday afternoon. It ate food uh, I got from a wildlife trust. Looked healthy, but I'm told uh, afternoon hedgehogs are difficult, especially at this time of year. Um, now, um, because hedgehogs are wanting to fatten up to be able to survive um, uh, their uh, when wanting to be able to su su survive hibernation, they need to weigh enough, have enough fat reserves for it. So it's it's getting it becomes more of a close call. If it's a small hedgehog, a young hedgehog, um, uh, by this time of year, if they're weighing less than 400 or so, 450 grams, they're probably not going to get enough weight to be able to survive hibernation and they're worth taking into care. Um, questions later. And say so yes. Click on the if you look at to the towards the top of the chat function. There's that little question mark button with four. Oh, four, oh my God! Have I missed more? Oh no! <laughs> no, oh, you have to follow things. them. It's just there's more <laughs> at the bottom. So I'm going to be here a while. Okay. So uh, what rural locations? Do, whoa. Let's go from stop. How can we encourage hedgehogs? Without encouraging rats. A very very good question. Um, you've got rats anyway. Um, but if you're putting food out for hedgehogs, Google finding a feeding station. Um, building a feeding station. You can put food in a feeding station and that will not totally prevent rats, but will stop other animals eating it. Two, what rural locations do, what can they do to help if we've had to space less roads, but a bigger decline? Um, partly it's to do with um, presence of badgers. Partly it's to do <clears throat> with the quality of, of the landscape. I mean, it can look like a green and pleasant land, um, even it's grass and grazing, but if it's just monocultures of, of um, perennial rye, uh, you know, it, it's it's not a diverse um, ecosystem out there. Um, the rural locations, it's yeah, it's about creating a, a mosaic habitat of lots of different sorts of habitats, um, making sure there are hedgerows, making sure there are avenues through the landscape. Um, use the Big Hedgehog map. There is a website called the Big Hedgehog map, and that's worth having a nosy at because it will give you the um, insight into whether there are hedgehogs there already. It may be that hedgehogs are present and you haven't noticed them. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, the presence on roads is a really clear one. One of my dogs is obsessed with catching hedgehogs. Oh, that's uh, uh, Paul. That's a, a very good uh, um, point. Um, the advice we have, I mean, obviously nocturnal hedgehogs. Um, so if you're letting your dog out into the garden at night, um, you, you hopefully have uh, the the opportunity to let the dog maybe bark first, put on a night light, 
uh, encourage the hedgehogs to move away. If the, it's a, a, a sort of dog which is going to go pushing into the undergrowth, finding nesting hedgehogs during the day, um, I, I would suggest making sure the hedgehogs can't get into your garden. I know that sounds, you know, we obviously want people to be able to hedge, hedgehogs to move through places. But um, uh, yes, there are places, certainly in, um, I was down at the in Dorset uh, a few weeks ago, and I was interested to find that, that most of the injuries people were taking into the hedgehog uh, rescuer uh, were dog injuries. Um, so, so dogs can definitely be a problem. Do hedgehogs become inactive or hibernate in cold and or wet weather? Well, Sandra, yes, I mean, they, they famously hibernate throughout winter, um, but up until they go into hibernation, they tend to become quite active because they're trying to get enough food in uh, and fat reserves uh, um, built up so that they can cope with hibernation. Um, so, yeah, ah, so here are the other questions which I'd seen beforehand. Going to start. There we go. Uh, and then was there anything? OK, I think most of those have been um, uh, have been covered um, uh, for the person complaining about me promoting my books. I don't actually have a job. Um, um, I'm freelance and uh, largely unemployable. So I, I will promote my um, uh, work because I actually think most people uh, will be interested to see what's out there. Um, so anyway, any other questions before we reach an hour in? I'm happy to be here for ages yet if you've got more. Any others? Okay. So, well, th <laughs> thank you all very much for um, uh, your attention. I hope you've enjoyed that. Please do sign up to the the petition. Um, I will. I will do my best to persuade Michael Gove to become a true champion um, of hedgehogs uh, uh, and wish me luck in that. And do you have anything you need to do sort of business wise for the Wildlife Trust or uh, do we call the evening to a close? All of the links and everything that he's referred to in this talk um, in a follow up email. So you'll have access to all of that, plus the recording as well. That's wonderful. It'd be fascinating to find out what I said. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Hugh. That was fantastic. That's great. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye.